with me. Father, um, as we look at uh, familiar scripture this morning and maybe a familiar topic, I pray that um, it's one we never forget and we certainly don't take lightly. And that is your love for us, that reckless love. And your desire to love through us to be able to love one another. Father, I pray that your word, your truth would just explode in our hearts and in how we live. To your love drastically change the world where we know God so loved the world he gave, his only begotten son. And Father, May your love through us drastically change our lives and change our families, change our community. We praise you and love you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're coming to uh, the end of a series that actually started right before Christmas and entitled uh, Created with a Purpose. And uh, um, we uh, looked the first two weeks when we started, obviously, about Christ's purpose and Palm Sunday and then ultimately Easter, and, and Christ came with a purpose in mind, and that purpose was you. He came with you in mind. He came and gave his life, lived his life, and died for you. And God obviously had that purpose in mind for Christ, but also, he has a purpose for absolutely each and every one of us. The reoccurring truth is, if you and I truly want to see the world changed around us, and it can be because of who our God is, then we need to allow God to change us. You are the only one. You are the only one that can allow God to give you purpose and hope and peace and power and his plan to make a difference. It's so easy for, for all of us to look at others and say, if only God would change, if only God would do in their life. And God just wants us to look at our own lives and say, God, what do you want? What do you have for me today? It's so easy trying to change others that we fail to see me. Story about a man who was talking to his wife on the phone, and she just saw the news channel on TV that someone was driving down the highway the wrong way, and he said, that's nothing. Everyone on the highway is driving the opposite way of me. It's so easy to look at others and think, it's their problem. God says, look here, where are you at? What can I do in and through you? You see, you and I were created for a purpose, with a purpose, and that drastically changes when we accept Jesus Christ into our life because now the focus is truly, God, what do you want to do through me, through Christ? Empower me through his power. God can empower you right where you are today. And he's given us a purpose, and he's given us a plan, but it's so easy to miss. I, I, this, this sermon was actually meant to be given uh, two weeks ago. You might remember what happened two weeks ago. A little snow. Uh, we ended up having about 70 folks here, which was awesome. But we also had a missionary here, Brian Phipps, and, and uh, that morning we ended up giving him the, the sermon time uh, to, to share to those folks. It was just a, a powerful time together um, and what God was doing in, in his life and ministry. Um, and, and so uh, um, that week, as I had prepared the sermon and was ready to, to give it, I saw this video on TV. Watch this video here. A little boy who uh, just was kind of working through life 
And he uh, uh, just kind of, I think he's a five or six year old, and he knows what his plan is, the purpose there. Just a tad frustrated, he finally gets it. Um, but he just goes through this routine and don't quit, don't quit. Whatever's going on in your life, just keep trying, whatever it is. And until you eventually, no matter how frustrated you are, kick it. <laughs> now, a year ago, this same little boy, the exact same little boy made national news. The same boy makes national news two times, and he's wrestling this little girl. Now, the amazing part is this little boy's dad was an awesome wrestler, and, and uh, you don't see it here. I kind of cut it out, but his dad comes in into this, and she got this figured out and is ready to pin him, and he gets, it, it, gets up out of this and is ready to once again wrestle but realizes it's so much easier just to run away. <laughs> There's his dad right there. That's where it was. The same boy makes national news. Why did I put that there? We got to know where God wants us to be because he has a purpose for us. Soccer may not be your thing. Wrestling may not be your thing. You may want to try singing or the drums or something. I don't know. But God has a purpose for you. And as we looked at uh, in the third week, Randy looked at the whole idea is that we have gifts and we have talents. And it's important to know our strengths. It's important to know our weaknesses. The gifts and talents that God has placed in our lives, but it's also important to know our blind spots, those areas that are just a little rough that we think we have it together, but others around us know better. And those are the places that we need to allow God in His grace and mercy and His love to change us, to make a difference around us. And friends, I'm not sure if you're seeing what's going on in the church. Uh, the church of Jesus Christ is under attack. There are big churches that are just struggling because of, of what's going on in leadership and in the church. So many times we think about this enemy around us, Satan, this, that is prowling around, roaring like a lion. And the battle is, is here. The battle is within because we don't understand what our purpose is. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians, uh, the end of 1 Corinthians 12, he says, I'll show you what's important. I'll show you the best way to live in God's family that the enemy or anyone can hinder because of who God is. Familiar scripture, 1 Corinthians 13, we're going to look at. Um, many of you may have had this read in your wedding uh, a few years ago or whatever. 1 Chris, Chris, Corinthians 13, if you want to follow along in a pew Bible, it's on page 1,637. And I'm going to actually back up to 1 Corinthians 12, 31. And, and again, uh, Randy laid out some of this when he talked about spiritual gifts and talents if 1 Corinthians 12 talks about the gifts that God puts in the, in the church, and he says absolutely each and every person has a spiritual gift. You, if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have at least one gift, and that gift is meant to be used for God's glory and within the body of Christ. And then he ends chapter 12 with this. He says, but eagerly desire the greater gifts, and now I will show you the most excellent way. 13 verse 1. If I speak the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but do not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain 
nothing. And Paul says, eagerly desire the greater gifts. But whatever your spiritual gift is means nothing if you're not loving. Again, does he say, well, your gift is more important. Mine really doesn't matter. That's not what he says. If you look back in chapter 12, it's obvious. He says, all are vital. All gifts are needed. He says back in 12, verse 25, there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. That's the body of Christ. That's the gifts. That's why we're here together. If you are serving in the body of Christ and sharing Christ, we need to make sure we know what our gifts are. Because that's what gives us passion. That's what gives us purpose. That's what helps us to realize how vital you are to what God wants to do, not only through us, but through his greater kingdom in the world around us. But then he says, I'll show you what's even better. Know your gifts, but I'll show you what's more important. Use your gift, serve the Lord and others, but make sure you bathe it in his love. My friends, love is absolutely the most single important attribute of a Christian's life. He starts and ends the love chapter, 1 Corinthians, making that extremely clear. Verse 31 of 12, I'll show you the most excellent way. And then he ends chapter 13, he says, And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is what? The greatest. Your faith is vital. The hope you have in whatever's going on is vital to your Christian faith. But love is the absolute greatest attribute that we have to share with others. Both here in, in 1 Corinthians 12 and in Romans, it lists out the gifts of the body, the gifts that you have that God gives to us to use in the body. And each time he, he, he follows up with, don't forget to love. Don't forget to love. In Romans 12, 9, he, again, he goes through the body, the gifts, and he says, don't pretend. Don't pretend to love others. Really, sincerely love them. Why? Because the gifts that you and I have, given by God, have nothing to do with me or you. They're given by God for his glory. And so he starts off 1 Corinthians 13 here with kind of some of those biggie gifts that we think about in the church. But notice as we read this, the I. The I. If I speak in the tongues of men and angels but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. We in the church make such a big deal about the pastors, about preaching, about teaching. And there should be, but that's not what churches rise and fall on. He says, if there's no love, you're nothing. The love is vital through our teaching, through the preaching. He says, if I have the gift of prophecy, if I can tell others about Jesus... If I know what's going to happen, if I have this head knowledge, if I have faith that can move mountains but not have love, none of that's worth anything. Now again, he wants us to tell others about Jesus Christ. He wants us to have Scripture as part of our daily routine, memorizing Scripture, allowing the Word of God to, to help us how we live our life. But if there's no love in that, it's nothing. Why? Because Christ is love. And John says, apart from him, we can do nothing. 
Verse 3, if I give all the possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. If it's just about what God has given to us and, and we give to others, which he wants us to do, or we serve others, we're in the church, all, which he doesn't want us to be in the church all the time, but he wants us serving him. But if it's not love, done in love, then we gain nothing. How important is love? It surrenders. It renders all of our gifts, all of our intentions, all of our talents, all of our abilities, all of our words as meaningless without His love. Without love, we are truly no different than the world. Without love, you and I rob the gospel of its power because you rob the gospel of its meaning. For God so loved the world. Paul makes this clear in Ephesians 2. He says, live a life of love. How? Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. Oh, that's how we are to love. Serving must go with love. They go together. And if that's true, and it is, then my friends, you and I must know what love really is all about. Verse 4. Let's actually read this together. Verse 4. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no records of wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. I would guess, if you've been in church very much at all, you understand how vital love is to God. How love is a vital part of God's truth, of of the Word of God. There, there are actually over 790 references to love and loving in the ENIV. And in Psalms alone, there's 144 references. And that love, it is important for us to understand, is not about passion. It's not even about friendship. It is a love that is deliberate in how we live our life. It is an intentional love. It's a love that is an expression of an act of the will. It is a decision we choose to make and how we treat others. God's love and, and, and the love he desires for us to share is a love that is so deep and heartfelt that, that it responds with Christ-like words with Christ-like action, regardless of how others respond, regardless of how we feel, regardless of how we think others should act. You see, this is a love that does the right thing even when we are wronged. And it does it nicely even when others are mean-spirited. This is not an emotional love of passion, of lust. It's not simply an affection for a friend. This is a love that may or may not be based on emotion, but is always the result of following God's passion to love others, even the unlovely, even our enemies. Think about that. Is that easy? Absolutely not. Some of us may have had to deal with that this morning, this past week. 
That is a love that is not easy to live out. <coughs> That's why it's essential that we understand what it is and how we can live that out. Now again, this is probably familiar scripture, but know that the love here is a noun that is paired with 16 verbs that show love in action. The first Corinthians love is, is the agape love, a godly love that seeks the highest good of those around us. If you look at this list in 1 Corinthians 13, you discover there's actually 15 phrases here. And the first two are kind of an umbrella, if you will, for everything that follows. The love which Paul writes is patient and kind. And then he lists out these eight other elements that love doesn't do. Now don't miss this. Paul is saying that the flagship of love is patience and kindness. It is, that, that is not our normal response to others who want to hurt us, to others who don't agree with us, to others who may think differently. That's why before love, anything else, it is patient. Now think about how that plays out in your life. Love is patient. Would you be more loving if you were more long-suffering? You were more patient with others? God's Word is so clear that for His children, love is not optional. They will know you by your love. It's not a matter for an agenda to be voted up or down in the church. It is essential. Love is essential. Agape love, seeking the best of others, is essential for God's people. Love is that thing which, if you have it, you don't really need much else. But if you don't have it, nothing else matters. And so in verses 4 to 7 here, Paul defines love by describing love. He shows us that love, what love is, by showing what love does. And notice in this, or at least think about in each one of these phrases, God's love is played out. And that should not surprise us because 1 John 4 says, God is love. You cannot separate the two. God is love, love is God. And so we look at verse 4, love is patient. In 2 Peter, it says, God is patient towards you, not wishing that any would perish, but for all to come to repentance. Love is long-suffering. Yeah, but he keeps doing this. They keep, doing, they keep saying love is long-suffering. It is patient no matter how what others do or don't do. Love is kind. Ephesians 4, Paul says, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. How? As God in Christ forgave you. Uh, I, this is a little bit self-promoting, but I do it to, hopefully, if it's something that can help you. I do have a, a website because of the book that I wrote um, that's entitled Before I Say No, and I do put regular blogs on there, and one of those blogs is Kindness Changes Everything. My friends, we cannot say we love one another if we are not kind to one another. Of all people, God's people should be kind to one another. Speak the truth, absolutely, but do it with love, with kindness. Then he says, love does not envy. You see, God's type of love is not selfless, not selfish. Again, we do not have to look any further than the cross. For God so loved, he gave. Love does not boast. My friends, boasting or bragging is quite honestly anti-relationship. Boasting always seeks to lift up the one doing the boasting. 
while quite honestly putting down those who are listening. Jesus' entire life was about lifting others up, about glorifying God in everything he did. Love is not proud. Philippians 2, do not let pride be your guide, but in humility consider others better than yourself. Than yourself. God's love, agape love, is always about humbling ourselves, putting others before ourselves. No matter what others do, turning the other cheek. Why? Because it is a love that will be noticed by the world around us. Verse 5, love is not rude. My friends, when we are rude, it only serves to push someone away from us. Again, in the blog, one article I wrote was, love and respect go hand in hand. Respect is not something that someone earns. Respect is simply because of who they are in Christ as a creation of God. And so love and respect go hand in hand. Trusting someone may be a different, but respect is simply because of who they are. God is always looking to draw people to himself in reconciliation because love covers a multitude of sins. Then he says, love is not self-seeking. You see, self-focus is quite honestly the opposite of love. It demands its own way. That actually was the, the attitude of the church in Corinth. If you were to go back into and read all of 1 Corinthians, it was about what was going on in the church, that people were self-seeking. They were looking for their own interests. They wanted to, to do things their way. And that dealt with marriage. That dealt with communion. That dealt with relationships, with leadership. He says, no, love is not self-seeking. The person who demands their own way tramples on others for the sake of self. Love is considerate of others, always. Love is considerate of others, always. But you don't know what they said to me. Love is considerate of others, always. Love is not easily angered. David understood this when, and was thankful for this. In Psalms 145.8, he says, The Lord is kind and shows mercy. He does not become angry quickly, but is full of love. David, of all people, understood that God is not easily angered. David, who failed many, many times, understood God's grace and God's mercy. Love keeps no records of wrongs. Romans 5.8, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Not when you became perfect, not when you got your act together. While you were still sinners, Christ died. He had you in mind for his life. Love keeps no records of wrongs. We need to forgive, but there's not a checklist when someone has done us wrong. We forgive others simply because Christ has forgiven you completely through the blood of the cross. Again, wrote a blog, blog uh, along this line that forgiveness is not an option if you want to have healthy relationships. My friends, it is vital to understand that forgiveness is not a side issue in the Christian life. Forgiveness is the very center of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For God forgave your sins. Verse 6, love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Don't forget this, love never fails. God's love will never fail you. When you love others through the agape love, it will never fail. They may not be accepted, as not everyone accepts the gospel, but it will never fail. And that is what he says spiritual growth is all about. 
Verse 11, when I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see a poor reflection as in a mirror, <clears throat> but then we will see face to face. Now I know in part, then I will know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Now think about this. For those who have children, or when you were a child, how did you act? How did you treat others? How did you share? Were you patient? Were you kind? That all changes or should as we grow up. And spiritual growth is not accidental. You must intend to grow up through loving one another. You must make a choice to grow up. Our purpose as a Christ follower is to become like Christ and therefore live out His love. Again, please don't miss this. It's not you trying to be like Jesus. It's about you trusting Jesus to live in and through you. The secret of the Christian life is not imitation, but incarnation. Letting Jesus Christ to live through you. And nobody can live the Christian life better than Christ himself. It's the power, Christ's power, that gives us the ability to grow up, to love when others hate. So what does spiritual maturity look like? Paul makes it clear here. I'm just going to ask you to put Christ's name where it says love in this. Christ is patient. Christ is kind. Christ does not envy. The rest of that is who Christ is, right? You see that in his life. You see that in how he lived and how he treated others. All of that is Christ. That is agape love. Now, put your name in there where it says love. Rick is patient. Don't ask my wife. Rick is kind. Don't ask my kids. Is that you? No. And most likely it will never be you because we have our old nature. We have the flesh that we battle with. We have our past. We have our personalities. We will fail at that if we are trying to do that. So what's the answer? Understand that the Christian life is impossible. You can't live it. But it is simple with Christ living in you. Now, in those, put in Christ and then your name. In Christ, Rick is patient. In Christ, you are kind. In Christ, you do not envy. Let's actually read that together with you putting your name in there. Let's read this together. In Christ, Rick is patient. In Christ, Rick is kind. In Christ, Rick does not envy. In Christ, Rick does not boast. In Christ, Rick is not proud. In Christ, Rick is not rude. In Christ, Rick is not self-seeking. In Christ, Rick is not easily angered. In Christ, Rick keeps no records of wrongs. In Christ, Rick does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. In Christ, Rick always protects. In Christ, Rick always trusts. In Christ, Rick always hopes. In Christ, Rick always perseveres. Christ's love never fails. Do you see that? Agape love is a love that is the expression of the act of the will. It will be challenging. But it is a spiritual character, a spiritual muscle that we simply have to exercise with Christ. No matter who you're living with, no matter who you're working with, no matter what someone has done to you, why? Because God's love never fails. And you can count on that if you allow Christ to live it out in your life. 
I put on there 1 Corinthians Peter 4.8 as a, a verse that I encourage you just to use as a marker in how you're doing. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Love, God's love, covers a multitude of sins, including yours, but the sins of what others have done to you. The second challenge there is I'll show you the most excellent way how can you or your family carve out time in the next week to serve others in an arena that will extend your agape love to them? And then the last one, I just encourage you to go back and read 1 Corinthians 13 several times. Make a list of what you believe to be your most unloving traits. Be honest with yourself, be honest with God. And as you think about that, how will you allow Christ to live in you to make a difference? Our worship.